1971, abortion supporter Judith Jarvis Thompson came up with an analogy in defense of abortion that is still in use today. Imagine, she says, you wake up one morning in a hospital, plugged in to a stranger. That person is a world famous violinist. They tell you that because the violinist was going to die and you were the only person in the entire world who had the right body type to keep that person alive, the Society for Music Lovers kidnapped you and they connected you to the violinist in order to keep her alive. But they add, not to worry, this situation isn't forever, it's just for nine months. Thompson uses the analogy to make the point that just as the violinist has a right to life, but not a right to use your body, so too, even if the unborn are human persons, they do not have a right to use their mother's bodies. And so, just as you may unplug the violinist, so too a woman may unplug her fetus. In other words, she makes the point that even if the unborn are persons like you and me with a right to life, it doesn't mean they have a right to their mother's body. What is the pro-life response to this? First, while you did nothing that resulted in the violinist being plugged into you, you were kidnapped, the majority of pregnancies result from consensual sex. Therefore, a woman chooses to engage in an act where pregnancy is a possible result. She may not like that possibility, but it nonetheless exists. You see, actions have consequences, and when we consent to an action, we must accept the consequences which flow from it. To borrow an example from Scott Klusendorf, imagine playing baseball with your son in your neighborhood. When you throw the ball to him, he hits it, and it flies through your neighbor's window, breaking it. What if you come to your neighbor's house to tell him that you're really sorry his window is broken? However, since you only consented to playing baseball, but did not consent to the ball going through the window, you're not going to pay to fix it. Your neighbor wouldn't be happy with that response, right? In the same way, it's unreasonable to say that one refuses to accept consequences from engaging in sex that they consented to. Now, having said that, someone may say, what about pregnancy which flows from non-consensual sex, from rape? That brings me to my next point. Parents have a responsibility to their offspring that they just don't have to strangers. For example, if someone is starving in your town, you won't be taken to jail for not feeding him. But if your child is starving in your home, that is considered parental neglect and you could go to jail. Parental responsibilities don't obligate you to do extraordinary things, such as trips to Disneyland, but they do obligate you to do ordinary things, such as feeding, clothing, and sheltering your offspring. Maintaining a pregnancy is simply doing for the unborn what parents must do for the born, provide the shelter and nourishment a child needs. It is what is required in the normal course of the reproduction of our species. I once debated a philosophy professor who anticipated that kind of response. He proposed a variation of the analogy. Instead of the connection being stranger to stranger, it was parent to child. He proposed the idea of a child requiring a kidney donation. He said it would be nice if the mother donated her kidney, but it would not be obligatory. Likewise, he proposed, it would be nice of a mother to donate, so to speak, her uterus to the fetus, but it shouldn't be mandatory. So now what? Well, at the heart of our reply needs to be this question. What is the nature and purpose of the kidneys versus the nature and purpose of the uterus? The answer to that question will convey why a woman is not obligated to give one of her kidneys to her child, but is obligated to give her uterus to her child. Once one looks at the function of the kidneys and the uterus, it is quite clear why the professor's analogy does not have merit. The kidneys exist for the health and proper functioning of the body in whom they reside. In contrast, each month, the uterus gets ready for someone else's body. Kidneys exist in a body for that body. The uterus exists around a body for that body. The fact that a woman can live without her uterus, but a fetus cannot, illustrates that the uterus exists more for the unborn child than for the mother. The unborn, as members of the human family then, must not be denied the environment that regularly waits in great expectation for them. Furthermore, with abortion, the unborn child is directly and intentionally killed in the environment made for her. In contrast with the kidney patient, that person dies as a result of kidney disease. As a physician friend of mine once pointed out, in the renal analogy, if nothing is done, one person dies. 
With pregnancy, if nothing is done, no one dies. The professor's kidney comparison and Judith Jarvis Thompson's violinist comparison can only be truly analogous with abortion if, upon denying one's body to another, she would dismember, decapitate, and disembowel her too.